Talofa, Malo Elele, and Bula Vinaka. My name is Ruby Fanaika Fangao, and you are listening to Pacific Business Podcast. Talofa, today we are here with Rex Tumalu. Welcome to Pacific Business Podcast. Please tell us about yourself, your family, background, and community. Oh, thank you for, for having me on. You know, um, like uh, like Ruby said, my name is Rex Chiwalu, and for my background, you know, I, I come from a, a small state. I wouldn't say a small state, <laughs> but uh, the east coast of, uh, of America, uh, which is Orlando, Florida, which is a probably crazy thing to say because uh, a lot of Polynesians, when they think of Polynesia and in the United States, you always think about the west coast. You know, California, Utah, Nevada, you know, all of, all of those places. But uh, Orlando, Florida, that was the community that raised me and made me really appreciate my culture. I was living there, my family. They came here to Florida because of entertainment. You know, they came here. My dad came from American Samoa. My mom came from Western Samoa. My mom went to school in Hawaii and she was, a, you know, she was studying for school. My dad actually went on a tennis scholarship in Chicago. <laughs> and yeah. they yeah which is a crazy thing and so my mom was dancing at the polynesian culture center in the 70s and my dad you know he was a fire knife dancer who learned from the creator of fire knife dancing freddie letuli who is the father of the fire knife dance he created it you know and my dad oh. was the second yeah my dad was the second generation of that uh whole dance and so he the way he paid through school just like what my mom did to pay through school is dance I think there was a contract on audition that was reached out to Hawaii and Chicago about SeaWorld, Ohio. And uh, SeaWorld, Ohio was having a Polynesian show, which was a long running Polynesian show. And they met there and then they did their contract and then they went to Florida and opened up the SeaWorld show over there. While my uncles were already here from Samoa opening up the Disney Luau show that's still going on. So this whole Polynesian entertainment is in my blood. You know, that's, I love entertaining. That's, I don't know anything else about my culture other than dancing. I don't know my language, but that's what keeps me rooted to my culture. My sister too, my sister and my brother are, are both dancers as well. My brother, he is uh, just like me, uh, uh, a world champion within himself as well. And my my father and my uncles and my brother are really the biggest inspirations of me starting Fire Knife Dancing and taking it to what I do now. So a little synopsis of a bigger, larger story, but yes, yeah, it's yes. a great story because you know, like you mentioned, we don't think, especially islanders in the U.S., we associate our community on the West, Hawaii, and maybe sometimes you know Utah, Arizona, Nevada, Texas, mm-hmm. sometimes. So, so I'm so glad that you're uh, representing and and you know, kind of broadening our view of our interaction with with the states also your family too i love that it's in your blood and i mm-hmm. love that i heard that that your mom paid for school with dancing is that mm-hmm. yeah I think that's a big deal because a, a lot of us do it for recreation and some of us have even stopped imagining that you can make a profit from it i guess because we do it so often or maybe not mm-hmm. as many opportunities but it's very mm-hmm. impressive that that you come from a family that has made profit from dancing, from dancing in our culture. Yeah, of course. Like, you know, my whole house <laughs> was paid off because of dancing, that whole entertainment world. And, you know, I think a lot of people, especially a lot of Polynesian people, they they only see dancing as just a moment in their life or just something that they don't really, they love it, but I don't think they really look at it as a career path of like, okay, we can just dance for this much, but I still got to go on there. But my family and others, you know, they, they made their living doing what they love to do. They love to entertain. Yeah, they went to school and they, they, they have their degrees as, as well, but their p- heart and their passion is, is what they followed. So yeah. you really can monetize your passion, you know, as long as your passion is strong enough. So you, you allow yourself to love your passion and enjoy the money coming from it. But you have to enjoy the passion first before you start to monetize it. And so you don't lose the love that you have for it. You know? Yes. yes. It, it, so the passion fuels the career. The passion fuels your 
making a profit and, and going out there and, you know, representing. So that is so awesome. Mm-hmm. Yes. And I also want to mention for listeners that, you, you know, we've talked about this uh, before the interview, how there's an intersection between entertainment and business that I mm-hmm. think needs to be reminded for our community because a lot of us are natural entertainers, but I don't think we always associate that with um, potential, with career potential and with mm-hmm. profit potential, um, which is short-sighted. And so mm-hmm. this our talk, I, I think, is exciting because it's different and interesting. Intersecting entertainment with business, that seems like an intersection Pacific Islanders should really put our best bet on because we're bringing our natural talents and then we're monetizing. Yes. Which is we're smart. Totally. I, I love that because that's my whole world is in the entertainment industry. You know, for me, being in the Polynesian entertainment industry and also I, that's for Disney. So that's another part of entertainment and also for the circus too. I do circus entertainment as well do, using Fire Knife. For us as Polynesian entertainers inside of the business, it's, it's different for us, I would say, because most of them are really family owned businesses and, mm. and things like that. Maybe something that we could get into is that for us, for me being in different things, it really showed me about business ethics it's not just about the show, you know what I mean? Because anybody can create a show. It's the stuff with marketing. It's the stuff with, you know, finding the right people, the right team. You know, it's mm-hmm. there's a lot of work that goes into it, but that's everything you do. Yeah. And being in Polynesian entertainment, especially for us that own it, you really are your own person. You know, taking care of a business, taking care of a show is like taking care of another person. Mm-hmm. So to really see it thrive, it's it's uh, it's really different for everybody, you know? That's awesome. And I know that you're, I, and I should have introduced you as such, a World Fire Knife champion. Mm-hmm. Can you tell us about that? How did you become that? Um, can you tell us about the competition and how many times? I, I believe it's multiple times you've held that championship. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is, a, this is something that I've never answered on a, on a podcast before, even though a lot of people know me as a Fire Knife champion. They really don't know the journey that it took to get there, <laughs> which is really, it was really hard and where the competitions are. But uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a World Fire Night champion. I won when I was 11 years old. That was the first time I ever won at PCC. PCC, uh, the Polynesian Culture Center in Laie, Hawaii. They hold the championships. And uh, my brother was already a Fire Night champion before me. You know, he was, uh, he's my older brother. And uh yeah, we competed in the fire knife competition over there, and that's kind of like the Olympics of fire knife dancing, kind of like what Mary Monarch is to Hawaiian dancing, and what the Heiva Taiti is for Ori Taiti. It's it's kind of like the best of the best go there, and I've competed since 2006 now, so now 2020, so almost 14 years that's of awesome. competing. Yeah, so I won three championships in uh, in Hawaii and four championships in the juniors in California, and also two inter- international championships. So me being 26 years old, that's a lot to wow. kind of... Wow, so yeah. young too. So you did a lot in a short amount of time. Yeah, in a short amount of times, you know, and competing in Fire Knife made me realize that there, there has to be more, you know what I mean? Like a lot of us, the Fire Knife world, it's... it's it, I always say we're those uh, we're those uh, obscurists, we're like these rambunctious little not you know outcasts that do this crazy dance. You know when you think of Polynesian dancing, first thing people think about is probably Tahitian dancing or probably hula. Fire knife is just just a crazy thing. It's hard to do. You know, mm. and in my mind I was like, okay, I'm a champion, but what should I do with this championship? You know, it's not. It's not the the title that you're given. It's what you do with the title. So yes. hope, uh, what we're doing now is hopefully using that title and doing it and creating a difference, you know? Absolutely. And for listeners who are uh, either don't know that much about Samoan culture or are not familiar, can you explain how's the fire knife dance connected to Samoan and Pacifica culture? Oh, yes. Yes. Oh, yes. The fire knife is such a big part of 
Pacifica culture as a whole, I would think, because, you know, every island has their weapon of choice. Mm. You know, uh, the Modis have their Taiaha, you know, the the Fijians have the spear and fan, you know, the the Hawaiians have their spears, but the fire knife, it's our war club. You know, mm. the, the actual dance itself came from a, a style of fighting called the Ailao, you know, the, the way the knife was spun. And it really wasn't made out of uh, the machetes that are that were commonly used later on. But the original fire knife, the legend has it that it was created by the war goddess Nafonua. You know, the the woman, the war goddess, created this uh, this tool that we call the Nifooti, which is called the tooth of death, because it was made out of wood. It was shaped like a blade, but it has a, a hook that came out and shark teeth. That was the original fire knife, or what we know today is the tooth of death. Then... Thousands of years later, in the 40s, you know, the the knife dance was just the machete dance uh, that you'll see, like, in old videos in the 20s and 30s. You'll see the the men just spin machetes and just the way the Ayla was performed. And then Freddie Letuli from American Samoa in 1946 went to, a, went to a fair and was doing the knife dance. And he saw a lot of uh, fire blowers, fire jugglers, mm-hmm. and went up to them and said, hey, how do you... Uh, how do you put the fire on your tools? And they showed him, you know, the, the materials and the gas. So he tried to do that with the fire knife. Got lighter fluid and the fire knife dance is born. You know, it's the youngest Polynesian dance ever created. Whoa. It was fire knife, yeah. Fire knife is the youngest out of all Polynesian dances. So it's, the, the tool is thousands of years old, but the dance is only 70 or 80. Yeah, I didn't know that before you shared, and I wouldn't have guessed it either. I, I guess because it looks so dangerous, I just was certain it was a very old dance that had been <laughs> made more <laughs> safe over the centuries. So, yeah, thank you for sharing that. Oh, man. It's it's a crazy story because, you know, I, a lot of people do these dances, but some a lot of people know the, the history of the songs they dance, but not where the dance comes from. You know, it came from Samoan warriors that used it for battle, and now we use it for entertainment. If you think about it, you can't picture a show or a luau show without a fire knife dancer in it. It's pretty much a given that it's there because of what was created, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Kind of reminds me of Maui, fire god that a lot of Pacific nations, you know, have in our mythology. Uh, Donga has mm-hmm. that, where he gave us fire from island to island. Uh, mm-hmm. He's the one. He, he's the bringer of it. And so, because the dance is new, this is not probably. It's probably not going to be connected to the mythology. But I was wondering if there was any story or legend or connection that you may have that uh, connected fire knife dancing with Maui. Oh man, with with Maui, it's it's crazy because I know Maui is used in every single iteration of Polynesian mythology. But for us in Samoa, like. Nafanua is the creator of the knife of the Nifooti, the tooth of death itself. The only reason why it was called the tooth of death is because of the hook that's on the on the attachment of the knife. You know, mm-hmm. and that was used to hook people's heads off and things like that. That's pretty that's pretty crazy to say, but it's true. You know what I mean? But a war, the war goddess is the wielder. She made she made the fighting style, she made the way it was used. That's why men and women do for uh do fire well actually women now predominantly do fire knife as well but if you think about it if you see a tau bow they spin the fire knife too but they do it in a different way but when i think of fire knife i I don't really go to maui i go straight to to her i think because of the way the fire knife is now it's very accessible to everyone you know what i mean a lot of us the tau bow spins fire knives we spin fire knives yes you know what i mean and it's it's a different style in which we do it but it, uh, the message is true uh, within the fire knife. It's really an individual thing. It's the way you connect with the fire knife. It's the way you connect with the flames. That's that's war. You know, that's the war that they've used the you know the tool for. But it's also telling you about how you defend the wars within yourself and in, and in your culture. So that's what the fire knife really taught me when it comes to connecting it back to something more. You know. For me, that's something, a fire knife is, is something that's never really talked about. You know, everybody sees the other dances, but the fire knife really 
really doesn't really get that much shine. And especially, like we said before, you know, if you want to know more about someone's culture, you got to look at the art. And that is an important part of our culture. So now uh, on to our next question. What is your line of business? So my line of business, especially for me, like I established earlier, I really in, in, in to the entertainment industry when it comes to Polynesian entertainment, when it comes to the dancing side, uh, teaching and all of that. But I'm very proud to be a part of a team called the Mana Collective. The Mana Collective is a, I would say it's a Polynesian media entity that we're trying to really develop and create, but it's such a multifaceted and nuanced company. You know, my, my line of business, is, especially with my with my business partners, is all about portraying Polynesian culture and Polynesian art in new and unique ways because we are very multifaceted and nuanced people, you know, and we really want to showcase that to the world. So my line of business is really about storytelling, creating and promoting brands and also building our people from the inside out and really showing the world who we really are and because we really want to I wouldn't say fix the way Polynesians are perceived in the world but I would say make a better understanding of the outside world's view of us in different and creative ways so the Mono Collective in a nutshell is pretty much that. So that resonates with me because what I'm hearing is authenticity when someone reaches into our culture and then uh, monetizes it or uh, turns it into a product there's less concern for the culture and respect, respect for the culture. And unlike uh, the Mana Collective, where the Mana Collective does sound like there's respect for uh, Pacific culture mm -hmm. and the art. And, you know, I think that I think that kind of adds to your brand, the mm -hmm. authenticity. And I, I think it also shows your heart. So so I love that. I love that that answer because it shows that. Um, yes, it's it's a for-profit business, but it's mm -hmm. also um, coming from the community for the community. Yeah, I think we need more businesses like that. To be honest, it, it, I think that ethics would increase if people had that kind of concern for what they're doing for a living. I, I think that's kind of where we get into stealing from others and not caring if we pay them and so on. Mm -hmm. When we don't have that kind of, when we don't bring our heart to the business, where where we would care how it would affect our community and so on. Yeah, I, something that I would love to share too is that emotions and business don't have to be mutually exclusive. Like you, you need to have emotion to run a business. You know, a lot of I know a lot of business people say that, oh, it's all about the business. Emotions doesn't matter. People's feelings, but no, that's not that's not true. Because the whole thing about Mono Collective is making sure that we show this culture in the best way that we know how to show it. But it's from the people, from our people, by our people, for our people. You know, Moliang Anu'u is our, it's kind of like our, our, our quote for Mono Collective is for the culture. You know what I mean? And I love what you said. You know, a lot of Polynesian businesses, especially in the entertainment world where I come from, this might not be a, a very popular thing to say, but I'll say it because it's, I've been in it, you know, yes. um, a lot of families that run shows just because they're friends with you, they'll take more than they should or they'll mm. treat you a certain way. But us, we're just trying to take this whole year, not just to build the community for our brand, but to fix the things that we need to for Polynesian. Because for us, we, we don't want to be the only game in town. You know, yes. we, we yes. want other Polynesian businesses to thrive. And we need to stop being in that crab mentality. When someone does good, we're going to try and pull them down. When we should be, you know, rising above. The the word collective and mana collective, we thrive off of collaboration. We thrive off of partnering and partnerships with Polynesian creators and, and, and entrepreneurs that want to make a difference. And in order for us to make a difference, we have to make a difference in our own communities, in our own lives. And so it is okay you know, uh, for us as a, uh, we're a very small team. Mono Collective, we're a very small team, but the way we feel about each other, the way we feel about our culture is what drives us and we're all best friends, you know? And so it is okay to have the family mindset, but treat your family with equality and respect and not as like, oh, that's my family, I'll pay them later. Or, you know, I'll do this, but they're my family, so they'll forgive this. But 
no, everybody has a fair share. We still have to pull each other up. Yes. That's business ethics, and that's good ethics as a person. Yes, yes. Uh, you shared so many meaty things that a lot of times I try to tackle on this uh, show, Pacific Business Podcast, because, um, you know, this isn't stuff you learn at home or in school. You just kind of have to go through the hard knocks of, of negotiating with people um, as an adult. So you're, you're adulting and learning at the same time. And so bringing mm -hmm. up the issues of uh, failing to pay because of friends, because their friends or family, because their mm -hmm. friends or family, and that, that actually sounds more exploitive than if it were a stranger, yeah. to be honest. And then also the, the unhealthy competition that happens in our community. And I'm glad you brought that up because, so, you know, you're, you're a champion, World Fire Knife champion, and so you love competition, but mm -hmm. there is a such thing as unhealthy competition like the crabs in the bucket mentality mm -hmm. that you brought up. It's so unproductive, whereas the collective, it sounds like you guys are promoting competition, but in a healthy way. Let's compete with ourselves and bring the best to the world and let people mm -hmm. see our best selves. Like that yeah. kind of competition. And you also bring up how, you know, everyone can win. You wouldn't be the only business in town. And yeah. I think that's beautiful because there's enough work to go around and yeah. no one can uh, duplicate, you know, Rex himself. No one can duplicate Mana Collective. But can we certainly have sister and brother projects and programs? Yeah, there is mm -hmm. enough for everyone to eat. And so I, I, I'm so glad that you're I mean, you're kind of illustrating why it's important to bring heart into business. I do think you have to be stern. Uh, you have to mm -hmm. be a good negotiator. But I think mm -hmm. without heart, you're going to get into unfairness. Mm -hmm. Without heart, you're going to steal from people. Without heart, um, you can't imagine a world uh, where there's other people in it. And so yeah. this is so beautiful. To me, this kind of also illustrates how important it is to have specific representation in the business community and in the entertainment community, because we bring these beautiful philosophies and conversations we're bringing our values, but our values just happen to be solution. It's all about creating a culture within your company that will make it thrive. You know, for us, we, for us, of course, we want to be big. You know what I mean? Every, every company wants to strive to be the best and the leaders in their community. Right. What Lonnie says to, you know, if the only thing a business does is make money. It's not really a successful business. You have to really think and worry about the impact that you're having on others, and then the money will come. And especially, like you said, you know, for us, with if, if family did that to us in business, it'll probably ruin a relationship. But business is all about harnessing relationship and fostering partners. And, and it's just like in life. You can't do things alone. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? You have to have a team. We have to think as a team. Our Polynesians, we're all we have. You know, yes. Work culture is very very important for the longevity even though we're only a couple months so it's yeah. we're thinking about the long game the longevity what will keep us here because there's a lot of polynesian brands out there that go for let's open up this etsy store the shopify store and we'll get money and then they don't think about what's going to keep your community there what's going to keep your fan base there what what are the people what's the reason why they want to come back and buy your product or see your shows or it's all about giving people a reason for them to really latch on and have a relationship with you. It's all about building a brand, building a community yes. within the people that you want to reach. What you just said really highlights what is, makes the Mana Collective special. You know, the idea that you guys are interested in, in uh, connecting and cultivating community and being a resource. So I just wanted to clarify for listeners um, is the Mana Collective a for-profit business? Yes, you know, and you know, and I, I know a lot of Polynesian businesses hesitate to be like yes, but we, you know, we we of course we want to make a profit of what we're doing, you know, and a lot of people might see that all oh, you guys are profiting off the culture, but it's about bringing it back, taking yes. taking our voice back, yeah, you know, any money that we collect. And even when we partner up with these people, it goes back to the artists. It goes back to the stories that we want to create. We want to create more opportunity for our Polynesian people to do what they love to do. Yes. You know, uh, I know there's a lot of people saying, oh, you guys are just profiting off the culture. Well, like, well, you're, we want to, you're educating yeah. them. You're educating yeah. them that, that it's 
it's okay to be compensated and mm-hmm. also I'm hearing deserving and I don't think mm-hmm. we hear that enough in our community in our Pacific business community that you do deserve to be compensated it doesn't have to contradict. I think we can be generous. I think we can be healthy and abundant. And I think we can also be properly compensated. We are deserving to be uh, paid. And I think uh, we forget that. I think sometimes we divorce being deserved to be uh, rewarded and compensated because we're, we're taught to just give, give, give. But yeah. um, you can, it, we can practice, uh, which is an indigenous value, we can practice reciprocity. And that's what mm-hmm. the Mana Collective wants to do, reciprocity. That's very indigenous. You know, that's mm-hmm. what our ancestors did. We didn't just give uh, with our obligations and, you know, with our duties for the community and family. We didn't just give. A lot of times that money was circulated. You know, the resources were circulated. And so similarly, I'm for it that you guys are a for-profit. I, I think most cultural programs are nonprofit, but it's nice to highlight the business aspect of these programs. and. Uh, the Mana Collective, it being for profit, I think it helps listeners dream bigger. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Because for us, you know, this is our passion project is Mana Collective. We still have, we still have the jobs that we do, but this is the pro- project that we want to give back to our culture. Like currently, what's the po- you know, I have my own podcast as well, the Friday Night Life, yeah, and also the Inner Battle short film. You know what I mean? These are this is creating art and putting Polynesian art in a way. And I love what you said earlier about uh, us in America. There is an abundance of Polynesian content coming out in uh, New Zealand and Australia, but almost zero coming from here. Right. You know? Why don't we give those people a voice? Why don't we why don't we find the next rock? Like, why does it have to be the rock and Jason to be the last Polynesian standouts? You know, yeah. why does it have to be singular? Why can't it yeah. be more? Yeah, like our voices, but I would say deep down, especially for me, I'll, I'll speak for me. I won't speak for the rest of the team, but being the voice for the voiceless that are out there, you know what I mean? Like we we can bring so much to the table as, as a Polynesian culture just by teaching our values. And like as you said, natural entertainers, you know, to find that they're not that they're not just going out and. They're not just going out and not following their genes because they think their voices don't matter. Like that's that's the whole reason Mono Collective is is here to kind of not just give our people more opportunities, but to give them a voice more than they've ever had here in the States, you know? Yes. And I also want to know how was the Mono Collective created? Yeah, yeah, of course. So the beginning of Mono Collective really started a little bit before this pandemic started. Um, the company was founded by Lani Tuitasi. Shout out to all our female Polynesian entrepreneurs out there. Yay! <laughs> the thing about me and Lani is, uh, you know, our parents danced together uh, at the Hawaiian Inn. It's this, I still dance over there. It's a, it's a, <laughs> it's a show that's in Daytona Beach, Florida, and both of our fathers were fire knife dancers there. And so that's what brought us together. Uh, she came to the show. She she moved to Missouri, young, and uh, or I think she was born there. But she was. Our moms were both pregnant with me, and and her during that time that she was here. But anyway, okay. long story short, they moved out west, and uh, we stay here, of course. And uh, we kind of reconnected a little bit before this uh, pandemic, mm-hmm. you know, and so. She went back and then we were messaging and, you know, for me, I've always wanted to do something like the what, what the Mana Collective is doing, but it's really hard to open up a big vision to sometime to our people, you know, because they're like, ah, why bother? That's going to take so much time. Mm-hmm. But anything that's worth doing is worth doing right. And so uh, we were messaging back and forth and she says, hey, you know, I uh, create I want to create something for our people. You know, creating something for our people and and to really show Polynesians in a different light. And yes. then we talk because then I had a vision of things and my my point of view where I wish our people would go. And it's just all about finding those people that have the same drive as you and opening their minds to what you think. And it's, it's all about the, not the compromise, 
but just really getting that together. So Mono Collective really started during this pandemic. And then the first thing that we did, she she kind of asked me, you know, what, what do you want to work on? You know, what is something that you think will push the culture forward? And then I said, well, if I had this short film in my mind and I've always wanted to do a podcast to reach out to the dancers because nobody hears their voices. Mm. You know, nobody nobody sees where they want to go. And Fire Knife Life podcast was the one that really kicked us all off. And then then her boyfriend Cam came into the team. And then, yeah, I want a collective. <laughs> For the short time we've been around, I feel like we've done a really, a really good job of harnessing the community and what we've had to accomplish, you know. Lonnie's the founder. She does all the logistics works. So like she does the, the stuff I don't like to do. <laughs> she does, you know, That's she does all the. Yeah. 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 She's the business lady. She's the, she's the strategist because that's her job. Her real job is that she lives in LA. I'm here in Florida, but she is a marketing strategist for an agency over there that works with brands from Netflix, Hulu, Amazon, mm-hmm. Snoop Dogg. And she wanted to apply that same thing to our people. What and, a blessing. Yeah. So she's the founder and CEO. For me, I'm like the head of entertainment. I, I oversee all of the entertainment projects that we have up in the pipeline to really kind of shape and grow that part of our culture, you know. And then Cam, he's our, you know, our lead animator. He's he's working right now on a animated short film that we are currently producing soon called Fire Knife Girl. So we're just really trying to push, you know, Polynesian culture out there and we have a new team member as of last week oh my god yeah we have a new team member his name is Kenton Kawatuli you know uh he is the host of Kava Systems podcast and you know we're slowly growing the team and shout out you know shout out to Kenton you know so for us Mana, we're all there's we're only four deep you know but what we have accomplished with the lookbook and with the story that we want to tell with Inner Battle the story that we tell with Fire Knife Life podcast and really bringing the entertainment world together with our with the way we view Polynesia is very is very I'm very proud of it for what for how long we've we've been around you know so that's how Mono Collective started and that's that's who it us you know the the Justice League oh, the Justice League I love it it's very beautiful so mm-hmm. so Rex we're gonna take a break um and then I'll We'll take a break for advertisements, and then I will. We will come back and then continue this conversation. So everyone, keep listening, so we can hear more about the Mana Collective dance world and uh, business issues with with Rex. Got you, got you. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. A quick word about Pacific Business Podcast. I'm looking for more Pacifica business owners to interview. The benefit is free promotion of your business. If you or someone you know is interested, then please email me, consulting at gmail.com. Okay, we're back. Before the ads, we were talking with Rex about the Mana Collective and about him being a world fire knife champion. But we're going to continue the talk on the Mana Collective service and products and learning more information about the dance world and and talking about business issues. Mm -hmm. So Rex, uh, what service and products does the Mana Collective offer? Oh, man, that is a very... It's a very big answer, but it's also very simple and to the point, you know. Uh, the products and the services that we provide is, is really 
very long term thinking for us. For right now, monetizing wise, you know, we provide the podcast, you know, the Friday Night Live podcast and the the inner battle short film that we're producing. You know, it's very visual, it's very art form right now. But the only things that we do sell right now is our Mana Lookbook, you know, really establishing one as a lifestyle brand of, you know, a modern Polynesian look and a fob look, but it's like very cool for us to really put out there because we really want to establish ourselves as as a life you know what i mean promoting your policy self and really being proud of who you are and embracing who you are so the you know it's really hard to really put that into an answer because for us it's all about entertainment right now it's all about posting content and the only things that are tangible that you could buy in the fall it's our mana look book that you can look on our website, you know, but the products and the services that we want to do, you know, is creating more, not just content, but shows and being interactive with our audience. You know, it's a, it's a larger plan out there, but it's, it's more about our storytelling. How do we create content that people can absorb, not just monetize, but absorb life changing things and impacting people in our culture within, hopefully touch the outside world and bring them to us. You know, so mm -hmm. it's a cliche answer, but it's also, you know, it's it's really hard because this is the first time our people have came into this world of not being a conglomerate, not being a monopoly, but being a person that provides more for their services. You know, yes. um, you know, the podcast and the and the short film is and and even Fire Knife Girl is phase one. You know, but there's more that we want to do now with the, not just with the modern brand but with the culture because there's so many things inside our culture that we can really but take control and be like okay this is how we can present our people this way and you know collab this way you know it's it's driven by the content creators and the entrepreneurs that we want to partner up with but also we have our own ideas as well so that's what we provide <laughs> excellent i it's, you mentioned Mana Lookbook, and it's available at the website. Mm -hmm. Can you can you read out the website for us? Yeah, so the the website is themanacollective.com. Yes. Themanacollective.com. We just redid the whole website. Website looks dope, you know. Yeah. Uh, for the first time, you get to actually see our bios on there, you know, not only Aww. just the, uh, not just our, our clothing that we're pushing out in the fall, but getting to know who we are because we really believe in developing a relationship with our audience. You know what I mean? A lot, and we want, a, a big thing, this is a big thing to say is that we want to make sure that the executive level looks the same as the talent level because we have diverse talent pool, but also a diverse level on the top as well to kind of foresee and foster this kind of community that we want to really put forth in our Polynesian, you know, in our Polynesian communities, you know? Yeah, you guys are such great culture bearers for your your carrying culture, and and I'm hearing a lot of authenticity, and and I love that analogy because that that really illustrates how you guys are different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think I think for all of us, we come from different parts of life. You know, mm -hmm. Kenton comes from the sports world, and he loves Kaba. You know what I mean? And then for me, I come from a dan the dance world, which for me, in my purpose with Mana is showing Polynesians and their storytelling elements, like in their, you know, movies, TV, stage, all of that. And Lani and Cam, they come from the business world. They come from like a different brand of life. And, uh, and when we brought all of that together, it was just, that's what makes us unique. You know, what makes you different is what makes you unique and what makes you valuable. You yes. know, everybody is valuable, you know? Yes, good team. This is a good team. And where is your company uh, located or what area, city, states do you serve? Yes, so <laughs> we are probably the most, <laughs> we're like a united team that happens to live in two parts of America. So me and Canton, we live here in Orlando, Florida. And then Lonnie and uh, Cam, they live in LA. So we pretty much operate from two different places <laughs> but nice. we have yeah but we have our weekly meetings on you know on google hangouts and zoom so it doesn't really feel like we're you know you know it's so funny ever since we started mana we didn't we haven't met together yet 
as a crew, like face to face. You know, it's all been virtual since the pandemic. You know, this wow. whole thing about pandemic really showed us what are we doing with our time? What are we doing with our with our resource of time? Because it's our most valuable resource. It's something we don't get back. And what are we going to do with it? So thank goodness for technology that really is the driver, key driver of Mono Collective right now. And hopefully soon we get to meet up in Hawaii to film Inner Battle. That will be the first time in a long time or for the first time that we'll be together as a as a full team. Yes. Well, I love that you guys are a team and friends at the same time. I think that yeah. keeps things lighthearted. And mm -hmm. uh, I think it keeps uh, you guys bonded. Uh, yeah. It's easy to let a project fall apart if you don't know or hate each other. But because of the <laughs> But because of the trust, I mean, close to friends are family, you know, family bonds are also also works, um, if not tighter. But I think your friendships will keep you guys um, at respect level because you don't want to make the other yeah. person look bad, you know, because yeah. you guys care about each other. Yeah. And we all put our name on this, you know, and I'll say right. this, too. I think they're going to laugh when they hear this is that me being a free spirit <laughs> and being the entertainer <laughs> that I am. These guys are really the people that reel me in, bring me down to earth. For me, I always, I told this to, to Ruby, and I also said this to uh, the Village Made podcast, is that me and Lonnie are kind of like Roy and Walt Disney, you know? A lot of people think the Walt Disney Company was just made by Walt, but actually it was the Disney brothers, you know, Roy and Walt. Walt was the creative genius, and Roy was the business guy. So Walt would be like, oh, let's, I have this crazy idea, let's do it. And Roy will be like, no, we can only afford to do this. You know, like you need those people in your life that bring you down to earth. Like we have all these great ideas where it's all about the execution. You know, it's all the way we present it and the time and the love that we put into each and everything that we do, you know? Yes. And I love that you guys get that, that your um, differences complement each other. And like you said, you you guys need each other. It's good to have a team where um, the other has something the other needs. So that's awesome. That's mm -hmm. going to keep you guys going. And yes, uh, yes. my next question is, what does mana mean to you? I know for uh, listeners who have been to Hawaii or are familiar with Hawaiian culture, or I guess maybe even pop culture because mana has become popularized, we know mm -hmm. it to mean uh, we we do associate it with Hawaii and we, we associate it with power. But, you know, in your own words, what does mana mean to you? Man, I think mana is a word. I think mana is that word that gets thrown around way too much. <laughs> like, mm. I think it loses its power and which is the meaning of it. You know, it loses its strength and its power the more you use it in a loose way. I think the way mana is in the world is mana is all about the power and the strength without any emotion. Uh, back in the day, it was all about being headstrong. But for me, mana is about being heartstrong. So what mana means to me is the courage to be tough in, in adversity, but also realizing that you're a multifaceted and nuanced person, that you have all these great qualities, whether it be negative or positive, mm. that create you as a person. Yeah. It is... It's not about, you know, everybody wants to wake up and grind, but sometimes you have to really, really put into account the vulnerability of, of, of your actions and the way you treat people. Yes. Mana to me is, is, a, is something that you live. It's not something that you post. It's not a, a, a cool word to say, but it's a lifestyle that you have to willingly choose to live every day. So that's what mana means to me, you know? Uh, yes, that that is a great answer. I I also heard kind of an equation in that where, I mean, if you really want to be powerful, you will have to reckon both sides of yourself, and it's the strong and the vulnerable, and it's a lifestyle. I also heard that it's a lifestyle which makes more sense than it being used in an empty way. It makes more mm -hmm. sense that it's a lifestyle. So so I'm glad to to hear that and its connection. Back back to the mana collective it really it gives us more of the flavor of the mana collective so what is your vision for the mana collective i know that you touched on that earlier yeah man i uh, i think this is the first time like that i get to really talk about the vision about mana because 
it's something that we all created. It's not just something that came from Rex or something that came from like for us. We really want to really for Mana Collective. It's all about showing Polynesia in the best light, you know, Pacific stories told by Pacific people. Yes. Showing things that are different, that make people relate to us. Our whole vision of Mana is getting into a lot of different facets of business, different facets of entertainment, that we're not just entertaining people, we're educating them as well. You know, we're not just creating the films. <laughs> We're not just creating the animation film. We're not just doing the podcasts. We're not just doing that. We're really trying to solidify a big impact to leave a bigger impact in people's lives because that's what the Polynesian ancestors did. What they did rang through all the generations, you know, and that's something that we want to do is leave a legacy of, you know, the entertainment business in food, in fashion, in arts, in, uh, in the community, uh, really, what I really love about what we've created is something that is very community focused. It's not all about like, let's create this stuff so we can just jam a million dollars. It's like, how do we make the community know that we care? Yeah, the thing's going on. <laughs> 